Okay. Um, I, I had a question. I received a question about what one can use for the exam. So generally speaking, um, the class notes, and I think you, I got a further question. That's why I think I already mentioned this, that you can use the, the class notes, either the, your own class notes that you're taking or my online notes or the official uh, handwritten notes that, that I gave out. But there is an additional question. If you type things up neatly and the summaries, can you use those? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's just a summary of what we covered in the notes or I covered in the class, that's fine. Um, but please print it out. So what I don't want is people, you know, using laptops there and then, then we have to go and check individually whether they're consulting some knowledge base on the web or not. Um, so whatever if you find it neat for you, yourself to, I always did that myself for, for exams, not that I could use them, but, but I wrote up, wrote up little summaries for myself and that helps with the studying for sure. Any other questions related to the exam? Okay, so I, I didn't make life easier for myself by drawing this complicated potentially yesterday. I had second thoughts afterwards, but now I have to do it, I guess. Um, uh, just to refresh the principles, remember we, we, we went, what, what brought us here was the fact that uh, for nonlinear dynamical systems on the plane, one can get a, a fairly complete understanding. In fact, I, I, I dare to say a complete understanding at least qualitatively what may happen uh, in the systems. And is that especially the case when the system is in fact a one degree of freedom conservative mechanical system, then you really know everything. And it doesn't matter how complicated the nonlinearities are, okay? All the things that we worked hard to understand stability, um, linearization, lin base stability, or the upper stability, bifurcations, normal forms, center manifolds, stable unstable manifolds, those were all tools that, that were really needed even just for local analysis in higher dimensional systems. but when you restrict it to the two dimensional, there's one degree of freedom conservative systems, you can get a global understanding of the phase space actually fairly easily. And um, it's all based on the potential. So systems of that kind uh, have this general form, right? That they do, they have a mechanical energy associated with it and the equations of motion are just uh, Newton's law. Mass times the acceleration is the negative derivative, negative gradient of the potential. And that's the key formula that, that enables us to draw a global phase portrait for these systems that by conservation of energy, this constant energy labels uniquely each and every trajectory. Each trajectory is contained in the level set of the energy. And it's just all about constructing the level sets. Now, at that point, you could say, why spend any more time? I just, you know, use MATLAB or whatever of a surface plotting program. And that's, I, I'm guilty of that as well. But time and again, I realize how annoying it is then then you start missing points uh, in the phase portrait because the, the level surface, level curve plot, plotting code couldn't care less about uh, dynamic properties and so on. It's more focused on some sort of optimality of some internal algorithm would give you, would give you some density of level curves. And when, um, uh, in fact, just, just skip ahead a little bit, it will notoriously always lose saddle points. It will lose connections between saddle points. It will miss, rather not lose, but it will miss homoclinic orbits, right? So instead of giving you a saddle point there, typically it will give you just an empty space there, right? And if you're not familiar with the fact that if you have two center points here, regions like that, then you can't just have an empty space there and can, trajectories can just coexist and pass by each other or, or, or work it out somehow without having a fixed point. And, and that's actually, people don't necessarily think about that. I, uh, I was uh, a colleague sometimes, you know, I remember a few years ago, I had a conversation with somebody and was surprised that, yeah, you're right. There has to be something in between because there's so much you're used to just following the, the, the plots that, that the contour plotting code would give them, right? So it is it is worth investing in that and you get this understanding. So what, what are the rules? The rules are symmetry, that uh, uh, each uh, trajectory has a symmetric pair, but the direction on it is, well, not that I've joined. So suppose it was, was like this, then there's a symmetric pair down there, right? And the direction of evolution is the opposite. On the upper plane, you always evolve 
uh, to the right, because having a positive x2 means x1 is growing. That's the structure of the equations. And uh, if you have a minimum, that signals a center point. And um, you can actually get an understanding, at least, of the endpoints of each and every trajectory corresponding to a given energy level. And that construct works until the topology, uh, until you're staying in the potential well. Uh, so in preparation of what, for what's happening when you're leaving the potential well, well that's going to happen because you're hitting a local minimum near a local, I'm sorry, local maximum for the potential. A local maximum of the potential signals a saddle point for the conservative dynamics. Again, you have this overall evolution of traveling to the right when x2 is positive to the left when x2 is negative. Uh, we talked about why uh, such a saddle point then, um, such a point uh, generates a saddle point. So the, we sort of identify qualitatively the stable and unstable manifolds of the saddle and we de deviate from those slightly. And uh, trajectories um, that fall below some energy level that I mark here can only exist in these regions because the total energy always has to be larger than, than the potential energy because don't forget the kin kinetic energy is positive um, definite. And therefore we figure that these be outside the saddle, they must be turning back and over the saddle, they must be passing. And uh, the only remaining two things to clarify were that, okay, now we know what, what this means locally. We know what these energies mean locally. How do I piece the global picture together? Because this energy surface actually intersects the potential again. And then we concluded that that leads to a, a homoclinic orbit. And when that energy surface actually happens to um, connect one maximum to another maximum, that actually means a heteroclinic loop. And then all of a sudden we realized that that's why the pendulum equation has this face portrait. Okay, and now we have a rigorous justification. And then I did one example, the Duffing oscillator, which is really a classic um, example for a system that has an instability and two alternative uh, stable equilibria. Okay, in between, and then we use this principle to construct and realize this this pair of homoclinic connections and. We, we had the small oscillations inside and we had large oscillations outside. And I said, using the same principle uh, and, and just sort of did my best to draw a complicated, perhaps overly complicated potential. But this is by all means, unfortunately, even reality because as I pointed out to you, just look at any rugged terrain. And of course you can have any complicated uh, profile for a terrain. And uh, imagine a small particle uh, sliding there without friction, then the equations of the phase project of, for the equations of motion of the particle will be precisely what I'm going to be drawing from this potential. So that's the physical meaning of it. So let's get down to it just as an application of these principles. Uh, and this will be demanding for me. I will, I will have to, not so much because of the theory, but, but, but because uh, uh, my, my screen is not that large here on my tablet. So drawing is always a challenge. So I will launch the domain here. So the idea again is that you basically uh, project things from the graph of the potential down to a copy of the, of the phase space. So here the coordinates are x2, x1, whereas the coordinate was here x and v, okay? X1 is the same as X. That's the way I introduce the variable. So how do you get started? Well, the first thing is just identify um, fixed points and then have a local indication of their stability, which you can immediately infer, okay? So in order to, for me to do that, we know that the fixed points are either local minima or local maxima. Uh, technically, one thing I didn't do, if you have a point of inflection, where, where the potential has a zero derivative, that's also a fixed point, okay? So uh, my, my plot here is pretty rich, but it doesn't have that particular thing, but I leave that to you to work it out. There's no fun, you know, major challenge. Though. So you could even, even have a point of inflection, okay? Generically, you don't have that. You have minima and maxima and the variety of those. It's just, you know, bumpy terrain. Okay, so where are those uh, extreme points, um, you know, maxima? There's, there's um, uh, one here. So I just project it down, right? So if I know what, there's one here, there's a minimum here, okay? There's a maximum there. So there, I already have a line, that's the axis. So I don't bother to draw another one. Uh, 
there's a minimum somewhere here. Okay, there's a maximum there, local maximum. Minimum again, boy, that's, um, that's really the magnified plot of the surface of an actual rigid body, which is this bumpy, obviously, um, when you look at it with a microscope. Okay. Uh, so those would those would be the the so based on that I can just go ahead and immediately identify corresponding fixed points. Remember each and every minimum and maximum when you take that location and set x to equal to zero at that location. That's automatically a fixed point for the conservative system. We've seen that. So all these are fixed points. All right. And then we start and take stock maybe from left to right. All the the maxima are saddle points, okay? And all the minima are center points. And I just indicate that with little symbols because I need to, I don't wanna take up too much space. I need to extend those uh, little graphical elements soon. I don't want them to be in conflict, but I want to indicate locally what I immediately know without any analysis. I didn't have to do any linearization. I didn't have to even solve um, this generally complicated right hand side for zeros, I on, only need its shape. So I'm just drawing the corresponding little local dynamics. And mind you, when I do that, this is already the nonlinear system. So the whole issue of whether the linearized dynamics capture the nonlinear dynamics, I can skip that completely for this class of problems. So now I draw here a little saddle and it should literally be little so that I can, I have room to continue that drawing with the center. Next one is again a saddle. I just draw short and unstable and unstable manifolds. Also know the orientation of my, my arrows. I mean, I don't exactly know the angles of these. They, they will change. Some of them will be flat. The other ones will be just 45 degrees. Others will be very steep. Okay. But always I have to respect this overall orientation in the phase space, right? So in whichever part of the, uh, in these invariant manifolds falls in this uh, quarter locally of the plane, then that, that's going to be unstable. And then it will have a counterpart on the other side and the stable will come in from somewhere here. So that's why without too much thinking, I've been drawing these arrows early. And um, one here. Okay. And then little center here, nonlinear there. So at least I clarified what happens locally. Okay. Then, um, I'm going to try to proceed some of these and build a picture. All right, let's now let's move from right to left. Not that I have any particular system that works better than other, but doing it systematically and always leaving room for the, so that I don't draw a too large structure so that it's in conflict with another structure that I have not yet foreseen. That's why I'm keeping them small, right? So let's just sort of move from here because I finished here. Let's clear things up to the extent possible here. So what's happening here is that I have a center region. And if I increase energy levels, then the I will have growing periodic orbits until I hit what? I hit, remember this construct, settle on one, one side. And on this energy level, I'm turning back on the other side. So this has to be a homoclinic orbit. So for me to draw that faithfully, I need to see what the turning point of the homoclinic orbit will be. And that will be done here, okay? So the homoclinic orbit, uh, this is where the drawing gets tricky. We'll have a shape like this qualitatively. Okay, it has to be symmetric. It never is in my drawing, but, but it's symmetric. Now I'm still staying in the uh, first working Again, just a matter of practicality. I want to clean things up first down below here, because if I do the other way around and I clean up the global objects first, then I'm, you know, I draw an odd global connection here, and I may not leave enough room for myself to work up the local ones. That's why, just a matter of practicality, I, I tend to just work from the local ones up. Okay, so I cleared up this regime. Let's let's jump to this regime. What's happening there? 
Well, this one has a large connection, this saddle to this other saddle, right? Because we see they are on the same energy level, okay? And mind the shape of the orbit will be just breathing together with, with what's below it. Uh, it will never stop in between, it will never turn. But this is how you see the X2 will vary because this is essentially the kinetic energy that you see there. And that's uh, in X2 squared. So it will be moving with what I'm inferring from the local pictures. So let's let's just compute complete the local pictures first. So again, as I move on in this direction, I'll see here an energy level which leads to a homoclinic orbit. Okay, so I I draw that energy level locally here, and then I project down that intersection point because that will be the turning point of the homoclinic orbit. Right here, so it's the, things are getting tight pretty quickly. So you know, I always remind myself to draw small objects, but then I forget because now see I have to then draw this homoclinic orbit, and it's already turning there. So had I drawn a bigger periodic orbit here, then now I would have a hard time accommodating everything. Okay. Okay. So that uh, that clarifies that. So I then move towards uh, to the left. So this is my next structure. What's happening there when I get out of the well? Again, another homoclinic orbit, right? This way. So for me to draw that, again, I launch a line from that local minimum. And that tells me that I have to come down here. And that will be the turning point of my next homoclinic orbit. But uh, so that's a bit tricky. Yeah because the, the drawing program does want like to snap to particular locations. Um, so I just go like this. So that's where the that orbit has to turn. So again, space is pretty tight here. But that's what that orbit does, OK? And if I continue this line in the other direction, like so, then I see that from the same saddle point here, there will be another homoclinic loop, which is turning here on the other end. So I bring down that point, sorry, to find the turning point of that orbit, somewhere there, okay? Um, so let's see, sorry. Come out here and then turn back there. Okay. So far we're doing good. Uh, and then I'm I'm coming to this point. And now it's time for me to actually draw in this global connection. Again, I, I waited so that I, I, I don't now I'm I can I can actually just use what sort of already drawn I've already drawn to ride on it. Okay. Uh, except that I still have something that I haven't cleaned up, and now I need to clean that up. But it will be—I'll be riding on these orbits because the reason being is that that whatever I constructed uh, from er from lower energy levels, this will be always just a small perturbation of that. What I, what I get at that energy level. But now I'm I'm realizing that I missed a little bit of uh, connection here. Uh, why? Because. Uh, this saddle point, not only does it have a homoclinic loop in this direction leading to a turning point, but also in this direction, right? That energy level also hits the potential in the other direction. So let me draw that in. Again, it resists that. So I have to try to get around the snap. Okay, so that's, that's good. See, things are really tight there because now I have to project this other homoclinic orbit turning point, which is very close to this one. So the other one will be just coming out here very closely, like so, and turning here. Wow, there's a lot of activity here. Uh, Except that, did I correct the right location? Yeah, and there's one more 
thing. No, no, that's that's the only one I wanted to clean up because now I'm ready to make the connection between this saddle point and that saddle point. And basically just riding on top of what I already have, keeping a healthy distance. So I start from here. And then I connect here. And again, what's what's below would have to be in principle symmetric, but it never is in my drawings. Okay, but it's decent. And the arrows, I don't even have to check on a case by case basis because I know that there's this overall orientation in the face phase, um, which is clockwise, right? I put an arrow on this one too. All right, so we've covered some, some good ground here. Uh, if I look at energy levels that <clears throat> still clear, let's clear things up here. Uh, the next interesting bit is here, right? Because that has a uh, associated homoclinic connection, that energy level, because it connects a minimum to an ordinary point in the potential. That's always saddle point connected to a turning point. So which means a homoclinic orbit. So we'll bring that down somewhere here except that it's not. Okay, better. So this saddle will then have a homoclinic orbit that turns there. All right. So then the next, next one, and basically the last saddle point that I need to clean up is this one here. On the one hand, it had a homoclinic orbit, right? A, a pretty long one, which I, I haven't drawn yet, but I will. And on the other hand, as far as I know, nothing. So that orbit, just after a little hiccup here or a bump, it will just keep having larger and larger kinetic energy, right? So that means growing X2. So after accommodating whatever I'll come up with here, it will have this basic shape in both directions, okay? So that's first, let's clear up this part uh, that, you know, I've already drawn this one, the heteroclinic loop. I've already drawn the, the, the homoclinic loop, sorry, the, the, the heteroclinic pair of connections with this one. And I know, and I just have to keep, you know, take care of this thing that's opening up. But again, before I do that, let's always clean up the local things in more detail. So I already started working on this saddle here, which turns, which has a homoclinic orbit that turns here. Okay, and uh, now it's time for me. I mean, I can even what I said for the law for this point, saddle point is the same here, right? Because the energy level of this saddle point is also such that in this direction, when I keep working out the orbits on this energy level, they have growing kinetic energy and grows without bound. Growing kinetic energy means growing x two in norm, right? So these orbits just generally speaking open up. So why don't I do that? Uh, I extend these orbits. It's just the qualitative plot, but they, it has to be symmetric. Okay, it's not a, not a straight line or anything, but I haven't specified the some general curve, but it's opening up. Then once I have that for me, then I can take care of orbits that say are on this energy level, which are also opening up, but they're turning back here and they also respect their continuity of trajectories. They have to fit into this smooth flow. So uh, their shape is something like this for one that I sort of pick randomly and it turns and again passes. Okay. And the limiting one is the is this one, right? Which actually runs into the saddle point. So it's the it it it, it, it is the, the energy level that contains the stable and unstable manifolds of this saddle, which I've already drawn locally. I just need to continue them globally like that. And then in backward time, I track out the stable manifold, something like that. And all the other orbits are turning here because they correspond to energy levels that are like this, right? So they have a per turning point right here and then they head in the other direction and then I have no information. They just, as far as I know, they go to infinity, okay? So I'm almost done, except I haven't talked about orbits that are on this energy level, which is highest than the higher than the highest energy level I've considered so far. But those are again orbits that in one direction here they will turn, 
And as far as in this direction, they just have growing kinetic energy. So their X to value grows. Other than that, they are just riding on top of the face portrait that I've already drawn. So let me just add one periodic orbit here so to fill that gap. And uh, now I, I draw the remaining, one or two of those remaining orbits. So they just follow the existing structures. Again, they come nicely down. Do a few waves, come down here near the saddle, and then this one turns back. And they must do symmetrically the same thing on the other end. Okay. And uh, anything else, I'm going to do one more. There's no change anymore because the topology of the energy of the potential doesn't change anymore. The, even the global topology is just the same. Okay, this is it. So pretty complicated, but doable. And it wouldn't take this long. I just had to, I just explained everything um, in, in detail again, so that you see it. Now look at this face portrait. This is, this is pretty complicated. It's very nonlinear, no linear system can do that. There are a lot of competing uh, domains where oscillations take place, okay? Lot means uh, one, two, three, four, five. We haven't seen a problem like that. We figured out the exact topology of how these oscillating uh, regimes end. Some end in homoclinic orbits, others are parts of homoclinic loops, double loops. Um, and we even have a, a heteroclinic loop here, right? So there's no way that I just, you just ask without, you know, having, without some knowledge of the, of the system or even with some knowledge of the system, the contour plotting routine would give you this level of detail, right? Or, and even, I mean, if it, if it does, it's good to have some sort of control as always, because we, most of the error that we make, I guess these days is, is input error, right? So we specify something, we, we give a function uh, to the contour plotting routine, and we didn't notice that there was a little unintended sign there, sign change or wrong parameter, right? So it's good to have an expectation, even if you rely on that, as to what the result should be, okay? So if somebody gives you roughly a, a, a graph like this, and for some reason you know that, that there's a symmetry in the system that forces these two bumps to be on the same level, then, then you, you know that there has to be a heteroclinic connection here. Now, I, the contour plotting routine, because it makes approximations, it solves nonlinear equations approximately to get this, will not, not get that, right? Even it will probably break up that, that orbit. Um, and, and, and same with the other connections, right? So arbitrary complexity can be in fact handled with these little principles. Any questions on this picture? Other than why it is so jagged, well, that's just my own drawing skills. But um, now you, I invested a lot in conservative systems. You could say, well, it's all gone when when you add dissipation, but not quite. So, without going into details of that, that that um, I'll just note here that say the most important um, case is what, that we add to um, you know effect that we add to conservative systems is damping. So addition of damping. And let's just, you know, a lot of the engineering structures are of interest are small, have small damping. Well, it's a small damping, then uh, what it does is uh, since saddles are structurally stable, there's small enough damping, it preserves the saddles and uh, it doesn't preserve the, the centers, but what it does, it turns them into their dissipative analogs, which is foci if the damping is small. If the damping is, is larger, then it can turn a center in, into, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, no, I said it right. It, it turns them into foci, spirals, but then uh, damping is large, it can turn them into nodes, which are sort of overdamped, right? So, so saddles uh, perturbed into saddles, Uh, centers to foci and actually stable foci if it's really spiral. So for instance, um, 
what what happens with with the pendulum type face portrait that I just so you invest a lot in sort of drawing this face portrait right based on the potential and and you say okay what I'm really interested in is now adding small damping have I done everything in main can I just throw this picture out the window and no this is still a good guiding line in fact for, for linear damping, which is this viscous damping, that doesn't even change the location of the fixed point. So your anchor points in this, this plot remain the same. So if linear damping, you know, it turns a, a mechanical system like this, mx double dot, and then v prime x, that was my general one degree of mechanical system, okay? And then I add the damping force, which is some constant times x dot. Okay, so when you then rewrite the system in in um, as a two dimensional first order ODE, x one dot equals x two, and x two dot equals minus v prime x one uh, minus k times x two, because that's the velocity. Okay, then what this gives is the uh, look at the fixed points. Uh, the fixed points were where this was zero, okay, and this was zero. But if x2 was zero, then this term is zero as well. So at, at those very same points, of course, the damping is out as well. So it, it has the exact same fixed points, the damped system, as the undamped system. system. So the, the fixed points do not move. So they are preserved. And that's true, not just for the pendulum that I'm just gonna plot here, but for any one degree of freedom conservative system. Okay, and so these points that, that you have identified qualitatively just from the potential, they're not, they are not going anywhere. They're still fixed points. And without any further analysis, doing linearization, can you still conclude that what used to be a saddle is still a saddle. And what used to be a center, if the damping is small enough, it will be a focus with the same orientation, right? So with, the, with those principles, if I now copy this and use it as a skeleton, which I want to do, uh, and kind of want to immediately have an un understanding of what happens um, to the face portrait, then here's what, what happens. So... The, the the center does the saddle doesn't move the set the, the other saddle doesn't move and the center doesn't move okay but this one the center uh, will turn generally for, for small uh, dissipation into a sink uh, of of a focus type so just draw it like that so trajectories here will start spiraling in into the same fixed point that you have identified for the conservative limit. That loss of energy will affect also the unstable manifold of the saddle. The same, the saddle points are not uh, connected anymore because you start constantly losing energy over this curve. So as you're losing energy, your X2 comes down and then it will, for small damping, you will actually fall into the domain of attraction of that focus. And what I'm describing here is actually true for all these objects here for small damping. So what this orbit will do is it will start shooting out and it start losing energy, right? And so there's no way when it's losing energy, it cannot connect to the same point anymore. So it will just kind of spiral into things. Now this equation still have the same type of symmetries that the other one. So if, if um, the original one, so if this branch of the saddle did that, then, then this branch must do the same thing. So I draw that. So, although I'm already breaking the symmetry left and right, but hopefully you get the idea. So same spiraling in. And what happens to the, the stable manifolds? Let's draw that with a different color. Well, they cannot, in, in, in backward time, you kind of gain energy, right? Because if you're, if you're in forward time and losing energy, then backward time you gain energy. So this actually gets lifted up okay but if that happens to that side part then then by symmetry it must 
happen to this other part in backward time. Okay. And then you sort of just piece together it's locally. This is what looks like what transpires. And again, the fixed points survive. And then general orbits here will just still, will still turn because we're still talking about a saddle point here. And even higher orbits just do something like that. And after some finite round of passing, rounds of passing, these orbits will lose enough energy that next time, okay, this time they didn't get sucked in, but at some point, they will get close enough to the stable manifold of that point so that if that gets sucked in, then they also get sucked in. So if you look at the, this unstable manifold, it may have a few good you know, turns here, but after all, it will get sucked into one of these. And that is a detail that will depend on the exact way that it loses energy. But it, again, if you, the damping is small, this is always the local picture and you can actually piece it together and uh, find out what happens. So uh, all I want to say is that this is the most relevant situation in practice in which you want to you wonder what happens to to the structure that that you painfully with in painful detail identified and then you can figure that out as well. Okay. There's also other ways to then in, include other effects such as impact, um, which I think you even had in one of your examples, a homework examples. Uh, an impact would be if you hit a particular position x bomb, which is a wall, right? Somewhere you could just draw it in the phase space. And then the income, if that's the only perturbation to your conservative limit and the impact is perfect, then whenever you hit that position, you simply switch to the exact same velocity in the other direction you start riding back, right? So that it will then, this is the way it will affect the, the conservative phase portrait. Generally speaking, to be realistic, at the impact, it will be not be perfectly elastic. You will be losing energy, which still means that you draw the wall here. Uh, but when you hit the wall, then instead of jumping to the exact same velocity with the negative sign, to jump, you jump to a smaller velocity. And the ratio between the two velocity norms will be de de determined by your coefficient of restitution. So generally speaking, for a non-perfect impact, uh, it will be less than one. So if you imagine you're, you're coming in with this trajectory, okay, then you jump, but you jump to a distance which is lower uh, than, you, than this initial distance that you had uh, from the x2 equals zero axis. So it says you jump here, and then you will be then uh, put on, on this orbit. If you hit that again, you jump. And you do that until you actually hit an orbit which is only tangent, it's grazing, as people say, the impact constraint. And that will act as a limit cycle and it will keep you there because then at that point, you're basically just grazing the impact, which means that you're, you're physically there, but you're, you really haven't been losing any energy, right? You're just kissing the wall, so to speak, right? And, and you're kissing that wall with a zero velocity. So there's, you're kissing it with a, a zero kinetic energy. So there's nothing to lose, right? So then you end this little spiel just ends up putting you on, on, a, on ultimately on a limit cycle, right? And if you are in a different position, again, then, uh, then you either never return to the site of the impact, or if you return for some reason, then, then you, what I have, you know, for these orbits, they have one impact and all they go, they're never affected anymore. But that would be the basic principle that you, that, that you can, uh, Applied. There's also principles for friction. If you're interested, you can look it up in the in the literature. It's a bit more complicated but doable. I'm just saying that it's not time wasted to figure out the conservative limit in in a complicated you know one dimensional system because then you can add these additional dissipative effects that bring tech, that that basically break your energy conservation and nevertheless the core of the picture is still what you have identified in great detail. And you can just build on that. Okay. Um, so I give you some idea how to do that here. Any questions?
I'm waiting for questions, but in the meantime, I want to move on and uh, start talking about two uh, planar systems in more generality. So this is about global behavior. No, now, not just in conservative systems, but in general in 2D autonomous uh, dynamical systems. So we're not going to have this much level of detail, but we, we will have a fair amount of detail about the possibilities, at least, of what can happen. So the system we're looking at is x dot equals f of x, and x is taken uh, from R2, at least once continuously differentiable. We have the local Lipschitz and, and existence of solutions. OK, for simplicity, assume global existence. Remember, one way of making sure that that's the case is assuring that that your that your system trajectories remain bounded because once they once you know that they are remaining bounded at least over a given finite time interval, then there can be no blow up in the solution. The solution exists globally for sure. So the implication is is that there exists a unique solution for any. Uh, for um, all uh, t and for all x naught. And the initial time I can select to be zero because this is an autonomous system. I start with a few definitions that will help framing our ideas. So definition one will be these definitions are aimed to frame notions of what was the long-term behavior or asymptotic behavior. So the, the, this more general theory of 2D systems is about predicting asymptotic behaviors because very often when you write down a model, um, that's what you're interested in. Say population dynamics or chemical reactions or even mechanical systems, often that's the case. What Ultimately, what, what am I going to be seeing when I launch a trajectory from a given initial condition? Right. So uh, these, this ultimately asymptotically over time, but in a qualitative sense, this is not exactly right. This is too vague. So can we make that more precise? So these definitions are about making that more precise and introducing notions that are well defined and useful in describing asymptotic behavior. So this P point is an what we call an omega limit point. Um, of the initial condition x naught. This is the definition, omega limit point of x naught. If there exists an unbounded monotone uh, increasing time sequence, Uh, denoted ti, i for, goes to one to infinity. These will be discrete times, not necessarily evenly spaced, but they're just time instances that are growing and going to infinity and they're unbounded. And these times I'm going to be sampling the trajectory. All of them are bigger than zero because I launched the trajectory at t equals zero. So I'm not looking at backward time images of that point such that when I evaluate snapshots, snapshots of this trajectory along these times as they go to infinity, then I see a trend. Namely, I see that those snapshots, in fact, converge to P. So it doesn't mean that the trajectory as a whole converges to P, but I'm able to take snapshots of the trajectory. And it's these are unbounded, not just finitely many, infinitely many, and they're growing in time. But if I sample the trajectory along those snapshots, then I will just see that it accumulates on P, okay, along those. So not the full trajectory. So uh, it, it does mean if I, hopefully I have enough time here, maybe I should, not, not time, but space. Um, let me shift the things a little bit so I give myself more room. Uh, it's, it's about this, that if you start with this initial condition P and your trajectory is just shooting off from that point, right? 
starts developing. Okay, then uh, maybe this is your first x. And now at t1, x not. Okay, and then whatever happens, it's not that important. But maybe then you probe the trajectory again. I'm looking at another piece of the trajectory, which is here. Okay, and along that piece somewhere I have x, t2, x naught. So I don't care what, really what happened in between. And then again, something happens that I'm not tracking. Maybe a lot of time passes, in fact. But somehow I'm able to, somehow what I find is that along this sequence, with the next element of that, so this will be x t3 x naught. See, I'm, now I have a growing number of points, okay? And if we, the trend continues, then a, a, a limit point, an omega limit point of x naught could be this p somewhere here, right? Because the trajectory, trajectory might actually be doing things that I don't even know. So I don't actually imply that the trajectory follows this path. I just, I just mean that I don't know what happens. Maybe in between it does other things, right? Maybe that does continual excursions for a while, but I'm able to take snapshots that if I only look at those snapshots, then ultimately I land on P, okay? If that is true for P, then we call it an omega limit point of that initial condition X naught, because so far there's a dependence on the initial condition X naught. Now there's an analogous definition, which then is immediate that I could require the same in backward time. And then I will, if that is the, that is true for a point Q, then I call that an alpha limit point. So that is, uh, is an alpha limit point of X naught if, it is an omega limit point of x naught in backward time. Backward time just means that I run the trajectories in, in backward time, uh, which means that I, I will give an x naught, then instead of using the dynamical system x dot equals f of x, I pass to the dynamical system x dot equals minus f, S, f of x, which will have the same trajectories. Uh, it's just that I'm reversing time, so I start exploring them in this direction. So if I find that if I start from this direction, and there will always be you know, points that converge on this point q, then that q is a, an alpha limit point of x naught, okay? And uh, why don't I then actually collect these into sets? Because who says that an X naught can only have one P and one Q associated with it? So the notation will then be uh, omega X naught is, I'll just write it out in words, okay? So not, not in set notation, is that the set of all omega limit points of x naught. And then likewise, um, alpha x naught would be the set of all alpha limit points. So perhaps you, you get a sense why I'm doing this already. Again, I wanted to firm up a little bit what I mean by asymptotic behavior. And, and trends and whatnot. And, and these definitions I'm also reviewing because they're not specific to 2D. I wrote, write, write R2, but it plays no role, right? In any dimensions, this is one way, one piece of vocabulary or several words you can use to start talking about asymptotic behavior or dynamical systems, okay? And, uh, and it's a bit more involved in general rather than just limits of trajectories. Because as we'll see in examples, um, who says that a trajectory has a limit? A trajectory only has a limit, strictly speaking, 
on which it accumulates when it goes to a fixed point. But there are so many other behaviors rather than just a fixed point, right? So there's that. And then the, the, the first thing to, to know is that we're actually already doing a little bit more than, than what's apparent on the surface. Namely, look at this trajectory here. If this point P is an omega limit point for X naught, then clearly, is it, all, is it not an omega limit point for any other point on the same trajectory, right? Because for any other point, as a subsequence or, the, or an extended, slightly extended uh, sequence by the addition of just a finite number of times at the beginning will work equally well. If I start the, the trivial example being just to uh, start taking a point next to X naught, I haven't even reached T1 along the trajectory, then sure enough for that point, the same sampled sequence of times will get me to P, right? It's just that I'm now launching the trajectory from this point, but it's the same trajectory. So I'm hopping like that, okay? Now, suppose I'm actually past the first point, uh, T1, and I'm considering that initial condition on the trajectory. Well, it's the same sequence of times, right? Except that I chop off the first one, but the remaining ones are still uh, forming uh, an infinite sequence of times, monotone increasing, unbounded, so it works just fine, right? Or is something before that trajectory, it doesn't make any difference. Then I just simply wait long enough to get to my T1, right? It's the whole tail of the trajectory. So when you think about that, you realize that what we're talking about is these omega limits, points and limit sets are really not just simply associated with points, but they are associated with whole trajectories, meaning that they are the same for all points on the same trajectory. So they're really just functions of trajectories rather than functions of simply initial conditions. So the, the thing to know based on this, that omega x naught and alpha x naught um, are the same. for all x naught points along a given trajectory. So they are really, just, they are, they are well-defined. So these limit sets are well-defined for trajectories as well. All right, so enough talking. Now let's let's see examples of these sets. So what would be, uh, I just want to highlight these definitions, I guess. Because they were important. So let's see simple examples. And so let's just sort of to make to verify our understanding of these sets. So the first one will be just a linear saddle point. And the, the only reason why it's, it matters that this is linear, I could have said anything else, is that I it's what, what you see is what you get on the whole plane, right? Because I'm only showing you a part of the system. Okay, and in order to answer questions about the limit sets, you would need to know the global behavior of the system. And who knows where this stable manifold is coming from? Maybe it's coming from another fixed point, right? Which I'm not showing. So to tell you that, to give you an idea of the global geometry of trajectories, I'm just saying for simplicity, this is a linear saddle. And that's the only reason because the concepts are not restricted to linear systems. So I'm just a linear saddle flow, it's given by a um, linear system. So it's the face portrait of the linear system. So the trajectories will be then the passing ones like this. And I'll share a few of them. 
And the question is now that if I pick, uh, say, this point, it's a generic point on one of these passing trajectories, and uh, see that trajectory is converging to this axis, to the x-axis, right? And in backward time, it's converging to the, the y-axis, so that I, I say x, y, so that there's something to talk about. So that's one trajectory that I'd like to describe in, in, in terms of these notions. And the other one will be, they say, the unstable, a point on the unstable manifold on the, of the saddle. And I'll say, I think it's um, x naught hat. And then this one will be x naught tilde on the stable manifold. OK. Uh, I want to have three of these next to each other. So move this slightly. OK, so the question would be, how, how what are these limit sets for the, the three points I'm showing? And then based on the note that I just made, those would be immediately the alpha and omega limit sets, not only just for those points, but for the whole trajectory going through those points, right? So for this and that, OK? So I start with the easy one or the most straightforward one, one would think, is the omega x naught. So x naught is here. Um, what's the omega limit set of x naught? And then by implication, the omega limit set of the whole trajectory going through x naught. Any suggestions? Again, you need to then imagine that and anything for which you can select a sequence of times that is monotonically growing. So you're basically sampling that trajectory through X naught. And, and um, you're finding that you're converging to that point along that time series that gives you an, an, an omega limit point. And then you collect all those points that you can generate that way or approach that way for X naught. And all of them together form the omega limit set of x naught. So based on that information, any ideas, any suggestions for the omega limit set of x naught? I figured I would pop that as a question okay. so that it would is sort of motivate you to think about it. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, since x will be always increasing, it will be always increasing in the x direction. So this means that there exists no limit set. Or am I wrong? I, I don't know. Oh, that's absolutely correct. It was a tricky question because I was trying to mislead you guys. I was emphasizing that you're getting closer and closer to this line, right? And then if you don't have a careful understanding as, as you have, Ahmed, then you say, okay, so he's getting closer and closer to that line. So that line is then the omega limit set, right? Because, hey, after all, the omega limit set is something that I'm getting closer and closer to. That's not what the omega limit set is. The omega limit set, as you correctly noted, is the set of omega limit points. So each and every point in that omega limit set by itself alone has to be a target to which you're getting arbitrary close. And that is not true for these points here, because you will be, even though you're approaching this, this line as a set, you're passing by each and every point and you never return, right? So for that reason, even though you're actually approaching this curve, uh, incidentally, you're approaching everybody else, okay, too, because uh, everybody's accumulating on that curve. So your distance from any other trajectory is really to zero, right? That's, that's why it's, it's actually, it's helpful not to define it, uh, these sets as, you know, as something that trajectory get very trajectories get very close to. Okay, um, so in fact, this is then the empty set, and it can easily happen. Maybe there isn't a single omega limit point. So this just means that this this orbit is going to infinity, and it has no distinguished asymptotic recurrent behavior because that's sort of a, the key people that. Uh, the notion that people also use in dynamical system is recurrence. Okay, so something that keeps popping up, right? Because that's pattern in some sort of signal. Okay, and that doesn't happen here. So by the same token, the alpha limit set of x naught is also empty. 
Now, I can only make these statements because I told you that the system is linear and hence what I see is what I get globally. Because otherwise it could happen that this particular one ends up in a focus, right? And then what I'm saying would be true because that would be an omega limit point for that trajectory. But since what I'm saying is that this is linear, linear system, no surprises, then this is okay. What about X not tilde? Any ideas on that one? X not tilde is this one. Omega limit set. Where does the origin peak? Uh, excuse me, I have to, could you please speak up? The origin peak? Because yeah, and nothing think. else on the on the axis, right? Because it's getting so it's really just the origin p. Thank you, and the alpha limit set. Why we're at that? It's empty because you have empty. to explode to infinity yeah, for the same reason. So you can have all sorts of thank you for you can have a variety of things. Maybe it's empty in both directions, and maybe it's empty in one direction. Maybe maybe it's not empty in either direction. Okay, um, if I now look at omega x naught hat, then I trust that you will now see that this is empty in forward time. And the alpha of x naught hat is not empty and it's equal to p because that's the point. You can take a sequence of times, right? Such that you see convergence of the sample trajectory points to p. Okay, so this wasn't too hard, right? Um, thanks for your help in figuring it out. Again, I move it a little bit further to the left so that I have enough space. And uh, this was the linear saddle flow. Uh, I'll just say linear system, okay? And this was the significance of that. Now let's uh, partition this a little bit uh, to separate, uh, sorry, I have a hard time selecting colors. I'll just partition things here and I move on to the next next example which will be something with a limit cycle so I have a limit cycle here in this system and um, here's the arrow inside then I have an unstable focus so things are spiraling onto the limit cycle the limit cycle I call gamma and from the outside, I'm coming into the limit cycle. Now this, I cannot say that this is a linear system. It cannot be a linear system. Some people think it might be, I know. Not in this audience, but I know people who might say, why not? Um, and the reason is that there's a coexistence of two sets, right? That's a fixed point and the limit cycle. Individually, a linear system can have fixed points. In fact, infinitely many along a line. And a linear system can certainly have closed orbits. We've seen that for centers, but not isolated ones. The linear systems always scale up from the origin. You have one periodic orbit. The minute you have that, you have infinitely many in any dimension, right? So the minute you see a system that has two isolated states that and not of the same kind in between that cannot be a linear system. So this is clearly nonlinear, but I didn't, I'm sorry, I was sort of refining the, the plot here, but I made it worse. Um, and I was also tinkering with the gamma here. So let me clean up this figure a little bit. Okay, so this is gamma, this one. All right, so I'm just gonna say that this is an unbounded orbit, which means that in backward time, this one, in backward time, it'll, it'll just you know keep spiraling. Okay, so that takes care of that orbit. And again, I pick, pick uh, uh, maybe one point here, that's gonna be obvious. Well, the less obvious, let's, let's make this, this one the kind of the easy one. This is x naught tilde right on the limit cycle, and this will be x naught hat. Okay, so um, any ideas on omega x naught? So that's that's that guy right there. 
So what's the omega limit set? I would say all of gamma. All of gamma. That's and the reason. So for each point on gamma, we can find some uh, subset uh, for which um, there will be a recurrence. Uh, exactly. So that so that just as you say, uh, because see. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. If I now pick any point here, and let's just pick an arbitrary point, let's go that P, that's my candidate, right? I'm starting from here, whoops, I had a passage, right? But then I'm going away from P, so no way am I converging to P. But now I can, I have a passage, right? Even closer. So I can always find times that, that those sample trajectories uh, points get close to P, but in, in, in no classical sense does uh, the trajectory converge to p that's why now if you thought this was an unnecessarily uncomplicated defini complicated definition thank you again for for answering the question then then you now start seeing the reason why so people have really given thought to this uh to come up with meaningful definitions that capture a lot of things you know, different things and since that is true for each and every p then all of us so each and every one of those p's is a is an omega limit point and uh, therefore the set of the omega limit set of omega x naught, and not just of x naught, but of the whole trajectory, right? Is x naught. But be careful that even though I'm drawing it that way, the trajectory, the trajectory, the end point of the spiral that I have drawn is a different trajectory. That's the fixed point. Okay. For this, this is clearly not true. Okay. So if I if that's a fixed point, and let's call call that. Let's call that something. Let's call, call it uh, x naught bar. That's the fixed point. Then, if I ask the same question about the fixed point, fixed point is not going anywhere. So that's an interesting case where the limit set of the fixed point is itself. Okay, both in forward time and in backward time. So even the alpha limit set of x naught tilde is just itself. That can also be the case. And if I now investigate what the alpha limit set of that trajectory was, then I get it's nothing else but the fixed point. So all sorts of things can happen. Okay. And finally, what if I or do what if I pick my trajectory on the limit cycle itself? A slightly different but similar conclusion that now that point will be running around the limit cycle so i can pick any point of the limit cycle and there will be a sequence of passage times in fact i can just pick the time at which the trajectory passes through that point and then it will not just even be a limit there but in fact it will be equal along those points to the point that i pick right which includes the case of limits so in that case, if I picked x naught tilde on the limit cycle, then it's again all of gamma, including the point itself, and the same for the alpha limit set. And if I then look at the point outside, then in forward time, it's the same story. It wraps onto the limit cycle, so it approaches our, any of its points arbitrarily closely. So that's a given then that, that the omega limit set of that x naught hat is gamma, and the alpha limit set, based on the considerations we had for linear systems, right? It's just empty. So you can have all sorts of combinations. Move this a little bit. Also move this one a little bit. Okay. So my final example would be the following. Also have the right color. One shape that we have also seen a few times here in this class is say a homoclinic orbit and the homoclinic orbit homoclinic say to Q. And now imagine this is not a conservative system. So in fact, I can have an unstable focus in the middle and then I kind of wrap onto this limit cycle. Not, not sorry, not limit cycle, but homoclinic loop. From the outside, I may just pass by. So let's assume that 
And now I'm not saying that this is bounded or unbounded. So the, the information is what you get. Here in this picture and not more. It's just that I need to uh, firm this up a little bit. Okay, and uh, let's call that other point P here. It's a point P and I'm getting away from that. That's this point here, and these are the arrows. This is all I tell you, okay? Then, again, just to test our understanding, uh, I, I pick a few points here on at various locations. Uh, this will be my X naught. This will be my X naught tilde, and this will be my X naught hat on that passing trajectory. So the omega limit set of x naught, that means that I'm, I'm spiraling and I'm spiraling out. So this really is like a limit cycle situation. One might be bothered by the fact that there's non-smoothness in the target set here, but who said it has to be smooth, right? So the target set is gamma. But if gamma denotes just the homoclinic trajectory, then we need to realize that the homoclinic trajectory is the, is the blue curve and there's there's the, the Q point here, which I now turn to uh, black. Is Q part of the omega limit set or not? Anyone against including Q? Okay, so everybody's for including Q, I guess. But, um, and indeed, that's just, but in this case, it's yet another example of a different type is that the, the omega limit set may contain several different trajectories. It does several different entities. It doesn't have to be the same trajectory. So, so that point Q, okay. What about the alpha limit set? Well, the alpha limit set is what that trajectory does in backward time, just goes to P, it's a single point, okay? And if I look at the omega limit set of X naught tilde, which is this point here, then what it does, it evolves and it, all, it always it approaches Q no matter, where I, no matter where I picked X naught tilde, right? So in this case, this is one of the cases where in fact that, that sampling uh, would not even be needed, um, or it can be an arbitrary time sequence because this is one of the cases that the trajectory actually converges to something, right? So it does converge to Q. Interestingly, in backward time, it does the same. So there can be cases, and this is an example of that, when the alpha limit set and the omega limit set for the trajectory is just the same. They do not have to be different, okay? And if I ask the last question, what about X naught tilde, X naught hat, and this is all I tell you, then unfortunately, both this and alpha are not well defined because I don't give you enough information to assess what happens in backward or forward time. In these cases, I have given you enough information you can answer the question. But here, the vital information about the asymptotic behavior of that orbit is, is not given. So you can't say. So not enough information to determine. They may be empty, they may be not empty. Who knows, right? That really depends on how I complete this picture. So presumably this gives you some then feel for the kind of the variety of things that can happen. And also I wanted to work through this because 
perhaps then you have a better feel for why these are good concepts. And they really basically, they don't sweat the details of the trajectories. They give you the build, main building blocks of the dynamical system in terms of asymptotic behavior. Now, there are some nice facts about this that people have proven over time, some general facts about the, the, the limit sets that may arise in uh, two dimensions, but the concepts are valid for in any dimensions. So I'll, I'll note that. Uh, omega and alpha limit sets are defined in the same fashion in any dimension. It's just that right now we are focusing on 2D systems. And uh, there's a theorem which is also valid in any dimension. But I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, using it currently in the context of two dimensional systems. And uh, it, it's basically two statements. One of them that if the trajectory that we're looking at, and remember the, the limit sets are really associated with the trajectory, not just with individual points. So if this trajectory is bounded, I know that from somewhere, then these limit sets have nice properties. So then omega x naught and alpha x naught, both. When I say bounded, by the way, okay, that also means bounded in both directions. So it's bounded as a curve, not only in, so tra trajectory wise, it means that both in forward time and backward time, so you're able to draw the whole trajectory uh, in a bounded box. If it's not bounded in both time directions, only in one time direction, then what I'm writing is only true for that time direction. So if it's only bounded in forward time, then what I'm gonna say now is only true for the omega limit set. If it's only bounded in backward time, then only for the alpha limit set. So I'm now assuming when I say bounded, it means bounded in both time directions. Then our, uh, is the first good news is that they are worth looking at because they are non-empty. We've seen cases already in which they are empty. So there will always be something in them. Okay, that's good to know. Closed. So they cannot be open sets. And here's the bonus. They're also connected. And these are all important properties because they give you immediately a general topological classification and in terms of what to expect. The minute you know that your trajectory is bounded in one time direction, there will be a set of these points, perhaps one. But if there's more than one, you cannot have two points like this, one and two here, because the set has to be connected, okay? And also you cannot have an open interval as an omega limit set because, they have to, but because it has to be closed. Right? So these are helpful things to know. And equally helpful is, so I'm, I'm listing it separately, is that they are in fact invariant sets. For the dynamical system. What does that mean? It means that they are, i.e., they are composed, they, which means they are a union of full trajectories. So these 
Omega limit sets will not just, just be points, some kind of set of points in the phase space, but they are trajectories themselves. The targets that we have been discussing are always composed of trajectories. And was that the case here? Yes. So in all these examples, you know, this was forward time bounded, not in backward time, right? So there you go. Its limit set was not empty. In backward time, it was unbounded. So its alpha limit set was empty. Look at this orbit. In forward time, it was unbounded. Omega limit set empty. In, uh, in backward time, it's bounded. In, I immediately know that the alpha limit set must be non-empty, sure enough. Also, what is the alpha limit set or omega limit set for the other one? A trajectory, not just a random point, but that by itself is a trajectory, okay? Again, unbounded in both time directions, both omega limit sets are empty, okay? What was the case here um, for this orbit? Bounded both in forward time, Therefore, I conclude that the omega limit sets are uh, uh, omega and alpha limit sets are non-empty without doing anything. There must be something. Okay. I also know that they both must be connected and closed and invariant. Sure enough, uh, fixed point is connected, closed, invariant. Limit cycle connected, closed, invariant. Right. So in this example, this orbit, again, in bound, is bounded in both forward and backward time. So it's omega and alpha limit sets must be non-empty, closed, and again, um, connected and composed of trajectories. In backward time, indeed, all those are true for a fixed point. In forward time, look at this set itself. It's no longer just a single trajectory, but, but it, has to, it has to be a set of trajectories forming and a closed set. So if for no other reason, when I ask you the question, should we include Q or should we just be happy with this gamma here, even without too much thinking, you could say, no, no, there would be something wrong if that was the omega limit set because the omega limit set has to be closed. So if Q was not contained in it, then it would be open and that wouldn't work because the trajectory is bounded, okay? So that has to, it has to be closed. And indeed, it's composed of two different trajectories. And it's invariant in all cases, also connected. OK? So um, these certainly check out but for the examples that I've looked at. But they are true for, for any trajectory. A key thing was here is the boundedness, OK? Because if you don't assume that the trajectory is bounded, then, then none of this is guaranteed, OK? The boundary is important. And indeed, in all cases where we either didn't have information here, or let's just assume that this trajectory is unbounded, then it really has no, it has empty omega and alpha limit sets. And the same was true for these trajectories. And the big deal is, and I think I have enough to state uh, the main theorem that works with these categories, and this is really one of the you know, celebrated results in uh, dynamical systems, which basically describe, gives you a complete catalog of possible asymptotic behaviors in two dimensions. And it goes by the name of the point of point Graham Bendixson. Really important because it's, it gives you a basic guideline as to what can happen in two dimensions. And uh, let me state it. So if I'm in the position that I have these nice guarantees about the old omega and alpha limit sets, which I, I will have if the trajectory is bounded, OK? Then, and here comes the complete classification, then uh, both omega x0 and alpha x0 must be one of the precisely one of the following. Okay. There would be three different categories a connected set of fixed points. So essentially, either a single one, if you will, or cannot have two, 
So it, ha it would have to be a curve of fixed points connected. connected. Okay, so that's one possibility. And we've seen examples of that. We have not seen a bunch of fixed points, but it's a possibility. We can, um, I'll mention one example. Uh, well, it, it, you can actually just imagine that I can slow down the rotation on this limit cycle so that all these become fixed points. So this trajectory will then can't get closer and closer to it, okay? But still, the rotation is slower and slower. It will take forever for travel, slower and slower and slower, but ultimately it will get to each and every fixed point, never will get to it, right? So this could be actually a shear flow on which the trajectories are like this, but the, they change orientation right here, and this would be the zero shear line, right? You always keep going, but you get slower and slower and slower. So there you go, connected set of fixed points, even, uh, on this limit side in a simple example. So that brings up me to the next possibility is a limit cycle. And a limit cycle. So I, I'm not gonna draw either this or two or three because it has to be a connected set, okay? And just a single one. Well, can, can I have a continuous family of limit cycles? I don't think so because then you will not be able to visit all of them in two dimensions. If you get, you know, so you spiral onto one of them from the inside, that means you won't be able to go to the other ones outside. So that's why one, one tries to think that maybe this is just an omission when I list the theory. No, it has to be a single isolated limit cycle and that's it. And you can certainly cannot have discrete ones because that would be then a disconnected set. And finally, this is perhaps the most involved one is a set of fixed points and their connecting homoclinic or heteroclinic orbits. So what are possibilities? You know, we've already seen this one that a single homoclinic loop can easily be, it's just a, okay, like that. So, so you can have something like that, or you can have then a heteroclinic loop. Again, just imagine that you have a, a fixed point here and you're spiraling onto it. Okay, that's a possibility. Or you can have a whole network of these So suppose you have one fixed point connected to the other, and that's in turn connected to yet another. And then that has finally a homoclinic loop. And this is a homoclinic loop too, and that's it. And this can be, and, this, and there's no saddle there. So this can indeed be somebody's limit set, they come in, and they start wrapping onto it. They get closer and closer to that, okay? That's a possibility. Of course, that doesn't end there. So I just put et cetera, because you can then build a network of, of saddle points like that. It can be you know, an arbitrary network with many homoclinic and heteroclinic connections. So the end conclusion, and that's why this is one of the big, uh, you know, guiding lights in dynamical systems is that this is all you get. So in a practical physical system, it, you either have unbounded trajectories and then you know, they go out of your range anyway, you know, and, but in a more reasonable physical systems, I mean, nothing really gets unbounded, right? So the, the evolution takes place, it takes in some bounded domain, then this is all you can get. And there's no arbitrary complexity. Uh, there's no chaotic dynamics and so on. This is all you can get. And not only there is no chaotic dynamics, but there's a finite number of things, a very finite number of things that can happen. So this one implication is that no complex, because I wouldn't call these complex motions,
uh, in uh, 2D autonomous systems. This is all you get. However, so two things, the Poincaré Bendixson theorem is also true on other two dimensional spaces, two of them, a cylinder which is relevant for the pendulum type dynamics. Remember that the appropriate face portrait for the pendulum really topologically is a circle across the line because one of the variables is periodic. But there are also other, we already talked about another important one, which say for modeling the earth dynamics over the earth, which would be the sphere, two dimensional sphere. So that's one thing, but there's a notable two-dimensional manifold surface on which it is not true, and that's the torus. Two-dimensional torus. The reason is that in the torus, you can actually have a dense quasi-periodic winding with two frequencies. And in that case, then the omega and alpha limit set for such an orbit is just the torus itself, the whole space. And that cannot happen in, in, in a plane, it cannot happen on the sphere, but it can happen on the torus. And you know, two coordinates on the torus would be phi one dot equals some sort of rotation omega one, phi two dot equals omega two. Okay, and assume that these are um, rational independent. So, so they have an irrational relationship, say, for instance, square root three, then when you draw an orbit on this torus, they will not have a common period. So the, the orbit will just keep winding and, and denser and denser. It will never close up. And it will get arbitrarily close to each and every point on the torus. And if it, as it gets arbitrarily close to it, each and every point on the torus is a limit point for any such trajectory, both in forward and backward time. So the omega limit set of each point and the alpha limit set of each point is just T2 itself for all X naught and T2. So clearly that's a counterexample. So it doesn't fall in any of these characters. Okay, I'm done for today. Any questions? Uh, yeah, could you give an example of a disconnected uh, limit, side, uh, limit set? I would be in trouble if I could, right? Because I just said that it cannot happen. No, sorry for an unbounded trajectory. It's just an unbounded trajectory. Yeah, yeah I could. Um, it doesn't. What I said doesn't imply that that necessarily happens, right? Because I didn't say that if the trajectory is unbounded, then, right? But it just so happens. Yes, you could have example. So. disconnected uh, limit set for unbounded trajectory. I'll, I'll just sketch an example, right? These are two invariant lines. Okay, running in different directions. And somewhere here, I have an unstable focus and I have nothing else, okay? So what I'll do then is I start coming out from there. I become more and more elongated and so on. I never run into 
this I'll, I'll pass by. Okay, so then if you track this orbit, then it's getting arbitrarily close to points of the upper invariant line and the lower invariant line without any end. So any point on the lower one and the upper one will be a, a omega limit point, right? And all in all, the omega limit set is these two therefore and is disconnected, right? And the trajectory itself is unbounded. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense, thanks. Okay, sure. So this is x naught, and this is omega x naught disconnected. And note that this is no contradiction because x t x naught is unbounded. Okay, but like I said, that just by itself doesn't guarantee that it will have a um, omega limit set at all, because the minute the trajectory is unbounded, we will not know. We have no guarantee in general. And indeed, we've seen examples, right, in which the omega limit set just became plain empty. Of course, I could have said, I could have taken the cheap shot and said that, look, it's an empty set, right? On the empty set, any statement is true. So I could have said that this has an un an, a disconnected alpha limit set, right? Why? Because it's empty. And on an empty set, by definition of mathematical logic, any statement is true. But unfortunately, you could have then argued back that, yeah, but it's also connected, right? And I could have said nothing to that. <laughs> okay, so that would have been the cheap answer, but I thought I would give you a more meaningful answer. I don't okay. think that works. Uh, I think you, you're you making an existence statement and you're not saying for everyone and existence statements are false over the empty set. Existence statements are false on the empty set. Yeah, you have to say for all elements in it because there's no elements. But if you're saying there exists an element in the empty set, then you're wrong. But did I say that? I just said that the empty set is uh, disconnected. So I just said that the, okay, I have a yeah. set which is disconnected, right? Yes, yeah, yeah okay. It? Yeah, okay. Um, I had a more organizational question. So if there are any other questions about the course, then they should be posed. Okay, so any, any other questions? Technical ones? I have a quick question. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so based on this theorem, we can infer the existence of a separatrix for a damped pendulum, right? Uh, Based on this theorem, can, can we in, infer the existence of a separatrix meaning starting from the saddle point going into? Yes. Right. But but for an undamped pendulum, we cannot say the same uh, because, uh, we, we, um, I mean, yeah, I'm interested because, because we cannot observe it using MATLAB, for instance, if we run trajectories. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, we said that it's intuitive to, to say that there exists something that separates both. But does this theorem, for instance, says that it exists, this separatrix exists? Or? So so let me try to understand. So if, if you look at, I guess we start from the fact that we have a saddle point, right? And we look at its unstable manifold. Yeah. Okay. Now, if the unstable manifold, if I know that it's bounded and I assume that's what you're mm -hmm. implying, because that's a crucial point, because if I don't know that it's bounded, then um, it's anybody's guess what's gonna happen. And if I go back to this example here, I can have an un unstable manifold, which is unbounded, right? Coming out here. Mm -hmm. And then it's not connecting me to anything. So I would need to know that the unstable manifold is, is bounded. Okay. If I know that the unstable manifold is bounded, then it can still land on a limit cycle in general. And mechanical systems can have limit cycles if the forcing and the damping keeps a good balance, that it can create a limit cycle. I think we'll talk about that in the next lecture, right? So I think I'm afraid in that case, if, the, if I know that the unstable manifold is bounded, then it can go to a fixed point um, or it can go to a limit cycle 
but in principle, if I've given really a large perturbation to the system and made it made it super dissipated with a with you know which can involve a combination of conservative type orbits and dissipative orbits such as this one, right? So in principle, I can have a system that has these conservative connect type connections, and yet in the inside it has spirals, right? But in principle, that unstable manifold could also then land on this. Now, if your question is though that that I add some reasonable damping to the conservative limit, say say linear damping, right? Then then uh, as I'll talk about the next lecture, it turns out you cannot have any limit cycles. Okay, uh, and uh, you will have to then converge to fixed points. So in that case, I think you can you can um, you can infer that. Okay, thank you. Uh, but perhaps you can come back to this question if I if I wasn't clear next time when I talk a little bit about existence of non-existence of limit cycles and then I'll I'll get into a weakly damped mechanical systems or what can happen there. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, sorry, just another quick question on your final note on the Poincaré Benedictson. Uh -huh. uh, so you gave a few examples of where it applies or not. Like does it extend to more generally to just like 2D manifolds in general? Like if they have this topological property, then it always applies, or is it just like we just know for these four examples that it works or doesn't work? Um, sorry, uh, uh, so we are talking about the, the, my final notes yes, here, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So th this these require proofs, so it's not not automatic the extension, some of which are harder, some of which are weaker. So I'm, I just say it always works because it, people have looked at it in the literature. So it always works. It always applies to the cylinder, okay? Which is an, which in a, which is an unbounded two-dimensional surface by itself. But if you know that the trajectory that you're looking at is bounded on the cylinder, you, you still have the boundedness requirement, right? That it works. Uh, for the sphere, I don't have to, again, this is something that people have worked on and proved. For the sphere, I don't have to assume the boundedness separately because all solutions on an invariant sphere are bounded by the topology of the sphere. So it is then a bonus that it, what I have said is true for any trajectory on the sphere. On the, on the cylinder, it's only true for trajectories that, become, that are guaranteed to be bounded, right? On the torus, again, everything is bounded. Uh, but but you can have reasonable behavior on the torus. I gave you one example, as, which is a counter example to the general claim that somebody would make that the possible limit sets on the torus are the ones that I have given. And here's a counter example. But I can also paint a completely regular dynamics on the torus as well. You know, just some fixed points and connecting orbits and spirals. So you can have nice limit sets on the torus as well. Uh, in fact, if you are able to say that that your trajectory is confined entirely to an open set of the torus which is which is like an open patch which is diffeomorphic to a part of r2 then you have the statement uh, because you're just applying the fact that you know because you could just take that slightly curved whatever curved surface or trajectories are in it and apply a diffeomorphism map yourself to r2 and apply it there, right? So that, that is the no restriction. So uh, to subsets, invariant subsets of a, of a torus in which you have a dynamical system that is fully contained in there, it would again apply if that answers your question. Yeah. But if you, yeah? Sorry, yeah, I guess my question is more towards because the examples you gave are quite suggestive because the torus, I think the word is not simply connected. So like if it were another, like it would a counter example always exist for a 2D manifold that has like sort of torus type holes in it, or, or are there no such results? Or I just, I was just wondering. I, I'm not aware of such results okay. because the, the, if the, that could be, and you know, the people keep working on it. The, here, the nature of the torus was critical. Uh, so all I know is that, that they don't apply, but then one would have to look at surfaces with different genus indi individually and see whether, whether one can come up with a counter example. That may may have been the case, but I don't that I don't know, to be honest. Okay, yeah, thanks. I was, yeah. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. No, I don't. Here, this example uses the very specific dynamics of the torus that the torus can admit dense orbits. So for any two any two-dimensional manifold 
that can admit dense orbits, you immediately have counterexample because you just take that dense orbit and then the limit set. So I think that's the topological question. Can your, can your two-dimensional manifold admit a dense orbit everywhere dense? If yes, then poincare Bendixson surely fails. Okay, yeah, thanks. And you're welcome. Anything else? If not, we can go to organizational questions. Okay. Um, so I, I'm a mathematics student in my master's. Um, mm -hmm. I really like this course, and I was wondering if you'd be interested if I contacted the math department about including it in the bachelor's, because we don't have a strong dynamic systems course in the bachelor to analyze it topologically. Um, mm -hmm. So would you be okay with that, or would you not be interested in that? Uh, Thanks for that. For th 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 um, the, uh, so I made this course a, an advanced course if, even within my department um, because I didn't want people in here who are just fishing for credits. Earlier on, it was, it was an open course also for bachelors. And for some reason, it, then it attracted a large number of people, a lot of additional work, and about 30 40% were only there for credits. I would be maybe with the best. But it also depends on the department. Maybe if the math department has a real need, which they haven't expressed to me yet. In fact, as you know, it was some work to get this approved even at the master's and PhD level, mm -hmm. then, then I would be open to, to it, yes. If it's an electable. Uh, All right. Uh, and I, I, you know, and, and I, if, if you do any sort of inquiry about that, they have heard a lot from me these days, so maybe I, I should sort of wait. But if it comes from the students, then always there's, there's a more immediate reaction, more natural reaction. If it comes as a need from the side of the students, rather than me yet trying to push it into yet another crowd within the math department. But thanks yeah. again. If, if you feel there's a need and, and you believe you have the energy to raise at least the start of the discussion, then I'm happy to participate in that discussion by all means. Okay, then I'll send an email and I'll, I'll put you in the CC. Thank you. I appreciate it. And then just one other comment on your empty set thing. It's very theoretical and logical randomness. Um, it's the empty set is connected, so it's not disconnected. Mm -hmm. Because for disconnected, you need to be able to partition it into non empty components. Um, and you can't do that. It is totally disconnected, though. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're right. It, it's random and, and just arbitrary, but. Mm -hmm. Just for example, said so. okay. All right. You're right. So indeed, so if I if I if I were to make the so in order for me to verify that if the anti set is disconnected or not, then I would have to produce two points in the anti set that that are, that are not connected by a path. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you, you need so, to be able to produce two sets. So I, would put, that are non yes, I would have to find two points that are not connected by a path, right? But I there's no single point that I guess that's the logic in the empty set for which I can do this exercise. So I guess in this case, you're right. Thank you. So, I just quickly looked it up because I, I had to struggle with the definition of it myself when I was thinking about the example. And so I found that's good. There's, there's tricky things about the empty set, right? Yeah. Thank exactly. you. That, you're right. All right. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll send that email out and I'll put you on the CC. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. No worries. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Uh, thanks. You too. Anybody else? Okay. We're done for today. See you next week. Uh -huh.